Good morning. My name is Keith Strain. I'm the retired pastor at First Christian Church down the street. Uh, as of next Sunday, I will be the interim minister of the Russellville Community Church. And uh, that means that I won't get to preach here two Sundays in a row, but I get today. And I'm delighted to be here again and share this time with you. Uh, I want to start with a brief bit of announcements. See, we're back, but we're not back. You know, and we're going to sing two songs that are very strong in our faith, except you're not going to sing them, but you can hum. And I'll give you something else. When I went to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, there was this constant sound. And what I discovered, it was the Jews praying out loud, but quietly. They were murmuring. And it was like a thousand prayers floating up to heaven. I give you permission to murmur the hymns. Okay. With that in mind, uh, would you join me in the call to worship? Followers of Jesus, by his cross, we are redeemed from the futility of sin. By his rising, we are free from the fear of death. By his love, we are made new in the living and enduring word of God.
God makes no distinctions. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all. So much so that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, trusting in God's grace, let us now confess our sins to God, who is ready to forgive you. Dear Lord, you call us to be your Easter people, but we ignore your way of justice and love. We have feasted while our neighbors have starved. We have profited while others have suffered. We have winked at prejudice and condoned hatred. We have polluted your creation, fouling it and threatening all of life. O oh God, forgive us. Fill us with your spirit. Help us undo the evil we have done by doing right by others and by you. Help us to follow Jesus by laboring for your kingdom of peace. Amen. You take this moment of silence to confess your own sins. Hear the good news. Through the humble birth, obedient life, the suffering death, and Easter resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord, God has forgiven us. Christ is risen. Christ reigns. Christ reconciles you to God. By grace, you are forgiven. You are restored. You are loved. Friends, believe the good news. And to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Will you join me now in the prayer of illumination? O oh God, may your word be in our wisdom and your will our way as we follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first reading this morning is taken from 1 Kings 19, 1 through 9. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had da done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up, ate, and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? Our New Testament reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark, second chapter, the 21st and the 22nd verses. Jesus says, 
No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth to an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. This is the word of the Lord. When I accepted this invitation to fill in for John today, I realized that I had been asked to do the same thing last year at First Christian. It is a natural time for a minister to take vacation. I mean, what with the demands and expectations of Lent, of the special services during Holy Week and Easter. In fact, it is so common that we in the ministry have a name for this week after Easter and also for the Sunday after Christmas. It's called Associate Minister's Sunday. (laughs) And with that attitude among the clergy, it's not too surprising that those two Sundays are also International Slump Sunday. Well, not true for you today. You're back in worship now for the second uh, Sunday. We uh, open today by singing Christ the Lord is risen and here we are here in this place that's your spiritual home, your place of belonging. And like everything else that has been touched by this pandemic, it's good to be here if only because it's one more step back towards normalcy and one more indication that we're beating this thing. So let me ask you, how you feeling? Now, as one who stood at the door of the sanctuary at the end of the service for 44 years, I found myself asking that of almost everybody as they went, how you doing? And sometimes, how you feeling? And it got me curiously an almost universal response. How you feeling? And almost always the answer was, Fine. I'm fine. We might have read uh, read a list that was as arm as your long of seeming endless ailments and concerns of the members of the congregation. I might have been aware that the person was facing issues, troubles, problems, choices. But the answer was always, I'm fine. And what do you say when that question is asked of you? I wonder why. Do we assume that the person asking the question does not care or does not want to know? Or is it because we don't want them to know how we're really feeling? Do we recognize it as being an insincere question, like something we ask, but we really aren't asking? I grew up in West Texas, and there it is very common when you're parting to hear somebody say, now y'all come see us uh, here real soon, you hear? And if you show up the next day, they look at you like, why are you here? It was just something you said. It was being polite. So how you feeling? My wife is recovering from surgery, medullary thyroid cancer. And she didn't want anyone to know. Why? Because she knew she was going to be bombarded endlessly with, how you feeling? Uh, Last time I had surgery and returned to the pulpit, I was very careful to give a detailed medical report so that everybody there would know how I was feeling. And when the service was over, as they came out, what did everybody ask? I'm fine, thank you. Well, a little over a year ago, that blithely bantered question took a darker turn. See, they're coming after me again. I tried to hide out in the Presbyterian church and it didn't do any good. I regard March 13th, which just happened to be a Friday, of course, as the beginning of the troubles in Montgomery County. On that Friday in 2020, they announced that the schools would be closed. Most of the churches immediately announced that they too were going to close. On Monday the 16th, 
the restaurants closed for dine-in, and only essential businesses could remain open. On the Sunday after Easter last year, it was the 12th of April, and I filled in at First Christian. It was that week that the health department reported that in Montgomery County there were 32 confirmed cases. And it was not until the 21st of May that we had the first death, and it was actually two deaths on that day. A year later, in our county, 4,134 cases have been confirmed, 87 deaths. In our state, Indiana, 699,000 confirmed cases, 13,131 deaths. In our nation, 31 million cases, 562,000 dead. So how you feeling? What I noticed a year ago is that when I asked that question, it had changed. All of a sudden, I really wanted to know what your physical condition was because by then we realized if you ain't well, it's very likely I won't be well. And what had served as kind of an innocuous form of greeting became suddenly a means of self-preservation. And then we engaged in what was called uh, quarantining in place, self-isolation. At first, it was kind of a novel inconvenience. And we discovered all sorts of things we didn't know. For example, we didn't know that Home Depot was an essential business. <laughs> or that toilet paper should be hoarded. That people could work from home. That your house would become your children's school. And that all of you could survive marginally together. Zoom became the th means of all meetings. Worship became virtual, and you could now worship God in your jammies while eating breakfast. Travel was greatly restricted, but then it didn't really matter that much because all the places people liked to go on vacations were closed. We discovered we didn't even have to get out to either dine or shop. We could just call or go online, and it would be delivered to us. The list, the seemingly endless list of COVID-19 systems were so on our minds that every time you felt a little dizzy or <clears throat> coughed or ache or pain, you wondered, have I got it? Should I get tested? It is interesting what we've been through, or at least I hope we're almost through. Families have been thrown together like never before, and some have creatively flourished and others are floundered. I came convinced that out of this, families were either going to be stronger or they'd break up. Technology, something that most of us cursed because we had to use it, has allowed us a connectedness that in the midst of this isolation, I don't know how we would have coped without it. Adaptiveness became the most desirable trait. Think about it. In January of last year, would you have imagined worshiping in the parking lot or preaching from the back of a pickup, ordering your groceries online, holding a Zoom meeting, holding a video chat with your family, having a doctor's appointment on your smartphone? Still, as we have adapted and coped, the truth is we're sick of it. We've had enough of it. We long to take these masks off and to close the distance with others and, and go and do and to be able to blithely ask, how you doing? And not mean, are you well or not? What we have is a severe case of COVID fatigue. We're worn out from worry and concern, from limitations and restrictions, and not to mention the physical and emotional demands of coping. And it is doing a real number on us. It has shortened our tempers. It's hardened our attitudes. It has divided us. With no clear, certain end in sight, it is hard not to despair. And the growing anxiety about our physical and our fiscal future weakens our immune system. See, I gave you something else to worry about. But since this is our time of worship, let us focus today on what our faith can say to us in a time like this. Our scripture is about one of the giants of the Old Testament, Elijah. 
You know, we preachers love to find a little snatch of Scripture and find a whole faith system to be built on it. So let's remember that what we read today is only a very brief part of the story of Elijah. Just prior to our reading of this story, Elijah's greatest moment occurred. It was his triumph over the priests of Baal, a fertility cult that was ruining and running rampant through the kingdom of Israel under its king Ahab and his wife Jezebel. He designed a winner-take-all contest to, to be set up between Baal and Yahweh, wherein the true God would be determined by which deity could send fire down from heaven and light an offering on an altar. Graciously, Elijah allowed the prophets of Baal to go first. They spent the entire day physically wearing themselves out, trying to get it to happen, and nothing. Finally, Elijah takes his turn, offers up a brief breath to heaven, and shazam! Fire darts down, not only lighting the pile of wood, but burning it so hot that it consumed the wood, the offering, and the stone altar itself. And then this is the part that doesn't appear in the children's Bible. Elijah takes out his sword, and he kills all the prophets of Baal. 400 of them. Then we turn the page of the Bible and we find the queen Jezebel declaring that she is going to do to Elijah what Elijah did to the prophets of Baal. And what does Elijah the triumphant do? He runs for it. The man who stood and slew 400 men runs at a threat from a woman, which may be a sign that he was truly a wise man. He runs from the area of Haifa up in the north all the way down to Beersheba, which is right on the edge of the desert in the south. And then he goes a day further. To our not too great surprise, he collapses. He is totally used up, totally spent. And it is what God did then that makes me turn to this story for us today. It is most interesting what God does. And hear it to be about you and me. First, God sees that Elijah is safe. And just like us, the answer was physical distancing. Although Elijah went a lot further than six feet. And second, though it is Elijah's calling to be the prophet of Yahweh, it is not the central issue of this particular narrative. Uh, Yahweh does not send him on a prophet refresher course. Rather, he allows him to sleep. And then he feeds his tummy. Yahweh being aware of the hierarchy of needs. You know that, that definition that says, if you're starving, don't tell me about the love of God because the growling in my stomach will speak so loud I won't hear your words of grace. It is only when Elijah is safe, rested, and well-fed that God has him move on to the next item of business. And my message to you today is just that. We need to be using this time to regroup, to revive, to reappraise our lives. And as we are hopefully on the home stretch of this thing, let me share this concern. As I see, it is so much of our hope for life after the pandemic being expressed in the term returning to normal. It is as if our ability to cope emotionally is tied to the idea that once the disease is passed, we can pick up life just like it was on March 12, 2020. What do we mean by that? What do we mean when we say to return to normal? It means we can go to church, we can sing hymns, we can shake hands, we can hug, we can safely be with family and friends, we can go out to eat or for a game or to take a cruise or to go to a show at the vanity. We can take off these masks, we can stop washing our hands, we can go back to school, we can go back to work. We can get back to normal. Here's the problem. We can't go back to normal. Elijah didn't, and neither can we. The things that were aren't anymore. Nostalgia is always a lie. Things never were as good, pure, sweet, and wonderful 
as our memory, selective as it is, wants to paint it to look like. Rather, what we should be doing, what we need to be doing, is to look ahead. I can make a promise to you today. You can write this down. This will end someday. And so the issue is, what should we be asking of ourselves? What should we be asking of the things that we're a part of, like our churches? And what we should be asking is, how are we going to be different? How are we going to be better because of what we have been through? Brene Brown has become one of my favorite speakers and writers, and if you don't know her, I encourage you to Google her. Brene Brown wrote this, we will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal other than we normalize things like greed, inequity, exhaustion, confusion, rage, hoarding, and hate. We should not long to return, my friends. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature as well. There are wondrous things that staying at home has caused or allowed. We have rediscovered family. We have dared to be creative. We have rediscovered gratitude. We have reappraised our definition of heroes. We have rediscovered our need for each other. And even nature itself has been revived. In the absence of humans, interesting things have happened. Dolphins have been sighted as swimming in the canals of Venice. There have been crystal clear skies over cities once cloaked with smog. With the national parks at times closed, the animals now roam where we used to have picnics. What I'm saying in all of this, friends, is let's look forward to the new thing, whatever that might be, to which God is nudging us to notice, to seek, to value, and to champion. We need to use this time to think forward rather than just longing backward. Let's learn from this horrid time so that we can emerge not just as those who survived in the shelter, but more like those who are reborn, that have been given new life and new hope. Isn't that what Easter is all about? But to do that, to boldly, hopefully embrace whatever is going to be new, new, we must use this time as our opportunity to be revived as Elijah was revived. So we might be ready for this journey, this new journey on which God seeks to lead us. Meanwhile, stay safe. Be prudent in your choices. Be concerned about others as much as you are about yourself. Give thanks for all you do have and whom you have. And notice all the ways that your life is blessed. And always and ever, look for the ways God is leading us into the future. Amen. Would you stand and join me as we share in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence we shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you? Will you be seated?
For our prayer this morning, I want to share you, with you a prayer that was inspired by one of the men uh, who so inspired my own uh, journey of faith to ministry, Robert Rains, who was at the time the minister of the Community Church in Columbus, Ohio. Will you join me in prayer? Creator God, springtime is a time of hope and renewal. In this season, there are so many visual reminders of the hope that is within us, sweeping away as it does our gloom, lighting the fear-filled shadows, renewing within us the passion for wonder. We come before you this day, O Lord our God, ready to be surprised by the wonder and majesty of life and to celebrate the new life that you have created out of all our dyings. For we celebrate this day what you have done in Christ Jesus our Lord, but it is not an event we celebrate as much as it is the realization that the life that moves through us like our very own pulse beat is your saving love. And yet, even as we come to celebrate the resurrection from death to life, the triumph of your power over all the power and limitations of humanity, we confess to being uneasy about our future. For despite the assurance of our faith proclaimed this day, we still need to know that you are with us and that we are with you. So let us feel you on our pulses and fill us with the faith that as we live and die, it is forever and always in the hollow of your hand. Release within us all those mute longings hidden in our hearts that open us to the glory that is you. Let your spirit blow through us, freshening our outlook and stirring us to new beginnings. Shake us and shape us into a springtime people with the glory of Easter in our eyes. For this we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The day of resurrection, earthly thou abroad, the Passover of gladness, the Passover of God. From death to life eternal, from sin's dominion free, for Christ has brought us over with hymns of Let hearts be purged of evil, that we may see our right. The Lord in rays eternal of resurrection light, and listen to His accents. May His soul come and pray. song begin. The round world keep high triumph, and all that is therein. Let all things sing and dancing, let notes of gladness blend, for Christ the joy that has no
We come into this place as a refuge from the lives that we live each day. We come to seek the presence and the reality of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, armed with the power of His resurrection and His presence with us. Go forth into this world which God has given you as your place of witness and try to be the presence of the risen Christ to all you encounter. Go now in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.